Hello, Squirrel Tribe. So real quick, I want to talk about the solar eclipse that's going to happen on April 8th. And then we're going to jump into something maybe a little more important, but different. I don't know if it's more important, just different, uh, different topic. But I do want to show you guys this. So there's been a lot of talk about what's going to happen on April 8th with this um, total eclipse of the heart. My brain does it every time and then want to go listen to the song. But anyway, the total eclipse on April 8th. And there's been a lot of talk about why so many cities that are in the path of this total eclipse are kind of sort of losing their minds, if you will, um, with the warning, basically warning the residents in those cities to stockpile, to go get a bunch of food and water, make sure you have gas, make sure you have all kinds of stuff, uh, because there are so many people that will be coming from other areas to those cities that are going to experience the 100% total eclipse, right, to see what's going on. And there's a lot of people who are like, why is this a big deal? Now, first off, this is hard to see probably, but I want to show you this picture. You can see there where the total eclipse is, where 80%, 60%, 40%, even over to 20%. So we're all going to get a little bit of coverage, if you will, but only certain cities will get a 100% total eclipse on April 8th. But I want to read this to you because I came across this and I think it's important to talk about this in the, the other direction as opposed to the be worried, be scared, whatever that a lot of city officials are putting out about the things that could go wrong with, you know, cell phone service being wonky because of the eclipse or because of so many people in certain areas overriding or jamming um, the cell phone service and things like that. I want to read you something thing that I think is very important, all right? So on the afternoon of April 8th, one of the most important global events you will ever have the incredible privilege of being able to witness will be right on our doorsteps. The total solar eclipse typically is a once in a lifetime event or even less for people who are unaware or unable to travel for it. The last one that was accessible to people in this portion of the country was in 1918 and we were uh, on the tail end of that one. We are now front and center for the second of the three for this generation. The most most magnificent and longest lasting of the three. And if you love yourself and your family, then I beseech you consider your plans on this day. When I ask people if they experienced totality in 2017, some people say, yeah, I think so. If you don't know, then no, you did not. You would definitely remember. The distinction between 99% coverage and 100% coverage is significant and astronomical. There are no words that suffice. Now at 99%, coverage, you can kind of see that the moon is covering the sun quite a bit. You put on some paper glasses and say, huh, that's cool, um, and move on with your life after like 30 seconds. During the few minutes of the 100% totality, you don't have to wear glasses. The disc of the moon blots out the sun, but makes all the more visible the peripheral rage of the sun, the true extent of its light and radiation, the phenomena of the sun that you don't get to see because it is too bright. Your whole world goes dark in the middle of the day. The crickets chirp, animals become uneasy and howl. It gets noticeably colder and shadows of the unseen elements of the earth's atmosphere dance across the ground like an astronomical disco. It is awe inspiring and there is no way to explain it to someone who hasn't seen it before without sounding crazy. Now, um, according to this, in Nova Scotia, Canada, only the Meat Cove area will experience 100% totality. In New Brunswick, Canada, for, for people in Canada, we talk about here in the States, I've already mentioned all the cities and stuff here, but in New Brunswick, Canada, the areas of Fredericton, Woodstock, Florenceville, Bristol, and Mira, Miramichi will all experience 100% totality. If you have children and you want them to have incredible memories of their childhood and the things you facilitated for them, drive them to totality. If you yourself just want to be a little more fulfilled with your life experiences and travels and are always seeking out new ways to enjoy our gifted creation, drive to totality. If you have an older loved one who has never been able to travel far and see all the natural wonders of the world, take them with you to totality. I did not write this. I found this and I thought that it was worth sharing because we have a tendency as people um, to look at the negative side of things and forget about the positive side of things sometimes. So I wanted to point that out because I said that in 2024, it will not all be negative. We will talk positively as well. And I think the fact that this is something that is a legitimate once in a lifetime situation is worth remembering for that reason, that it's a once in a lifetime positive thing that you will at that point of 100% totality be able to look directly where the sun should be and it not 
hurt you, which generally speaking, you can't do right now. The, you know, the animals losing their mind and getting a little crazy. That part's a little concerning, not going to lie, but I think it is, if you are in the range of 100% totality, it's worth driving towards it. Um, if you have the ability to do so, I said before, if you happen to be in those areas, like you live there, maybe stay in your little pocket of safety of your house or whatever else just because there will be a lot of people going in there and if you do plan on going traveling towards it to to see what it's like make sure you have a full tank of gas have a little extra thing of uh, fuel in your trunk waiting to fill up because the gas stations are going to be hellacious make sure you have some bottled water and some snacks just to be on the safe side because it is a once in a lifetime situation. It is going to be extremely popular. And, and what think of New York Times Square on New Year's Eve, how that place is just a zoo. This will be the same thing, I think, as New York Times Square, New Year's Eve. You're going to see this in little random towns throughout the, the path of totality uh, on April 8th. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because, I, again, I think it's important to talk about. Now, what I do want to talk about right now, I have like five different things. I have an airport thing I want to talk about, but we're going to do that some other time. The other one I wanted to talk about is, I've lost it, so please hold one second. All right, I found it. Sometimes Gmail just likes to hide my stuff from me. Like I looked in trash, did I accidentally trash this thing? No, Gmail just likes to do really stupid stuff. So there's an article that came out on Yahoo and it was basically about the, um, what they call the dirty dozen, the foods that they consider the dirty dozen. And my first thought was every time I see an article like this, I'm like, what is left? Like they keep telling us, don't eat this, don't eat that. This is bioengineered. This is whatever. This is, you know, full of pesticides. This is what causes salmon, salmon salmonella. This is what causes, um, other food poisoning, whatever. Y'all it's getting hot in here. Um, sorry, I'm trying. The Jeep is only so big. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that makes it makes you like scared to eat food, right? You got to eat. All right. You have to eat no matter what you have to eat and you have to do what you can do for yourself. If it's the, you know, ramen noodles and packs of tuna and the, the, the fruits and vegetables at Walmart, it is what it is. You do what you have to do to be able to eat. Right. But it, we should still all have some sort of idea of what's going on with our food, what's going on with manufacturing of our food, where our food is coming from. So when I saw this article on the dirty dozen, I felt like it's something I needed to look into and then bring to you guys. Now I do want to go ahead and I've got a couple little screenshots that I saved here and remind people the difference between organic and non-organic. I talk all the time about how I personally prefer organic and there's people that are like, well, organic doesn't matter. It's all a scam, it, whatever, whatever. And that may be the case in some instances because nothing is 100% organic, all right? I fully understand that. And I, I am aware of that when I go buy things. So the definition of organic is um, of food or farming methods produced or involving production without the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, or other artificial agents, right? That's what organic farming is. Non-organic farming uh, is not involving or relating to production by organic methods. Pretty much all that means. Now, are pesticides used on organic foods? Because that's what people worry about, right? Organically grown food is uh, food grown and processed using no synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. Pesticides derived from natural sources, such as biological pesticides, may be used in producing organically grown food. This is from the USDA website, right? Now, products sold, labeled, or represented as organic must have at least 95% certified organic content. Products sold, labeled, and represented as made with organic must have at least 70% certified organic content. The USDA organic seal may not be used on these products. So if you see the USDA organic seal, that means it is 95% or more organic. If something claims itself to be organic, but does not have that round circle that I didn't get a picture of it, but it's a round circle and there's like a little line in it. And on the very top part, it says USDA, which I think is in green. And then below it, it's white and it says organic, right? If it does not have that, then it is probably the only 70% certified organic content. There are plenty of things on the shelves that will tell you they're organic 
and I, you don't see that label, just know that it's not 95% organic, it's only 70% organic, which is good to know. It's good to have these things in your mind to, to kind of sort of understand exactly the loopholes, if you will, <laughs> that our government implements when it comes to our food. The loophole being you can label it organic, even if it's only 70% organic, if it has the sticker, then it's 95% organic, which I think is very important to remember. Now, here is the article. This is, again, like I said, on Yahoo. Um, there's other places. It's technically a CNN article on Yahoo. They, I guess they grabbed it and threw it on their website because people like to steal things and borrow things and whatnot. But these are what they are calling the dirty dozen. And of course, these are all things that I eat. But I also try to get as many of these as organic as I can because I know a lot of them are going to be the highest pesticides, the Monsanto um, fertilizer and things like that. If you've never watched a documentary that, that involves learning about Monsanto, 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 it's Monsanto, and how they basically have ruined um farming agricultural farming uh because of the the what are like the barriers they put on farmers from being able to use anything that is not theirs it's it's very concerning for our food and our future but right now we're going to jump into this so according to this approximately 95 percent of non-organic strawberries leafy greens such as spinach and kale collard and mustard greens grapes peaches and pears tested by the United States government contained detectable levels of pesticides. This is according to the 2024 Shopper's Guide to Pesticides and Produce. Now, nectarines, apples, bell and hot peppers, cherries, blueberries, and green beans rounded out the list of the 12 most contaminated samples of produce. It's dubbed the Dirty Dozen by the Environmental Working Group, or EWG for short, which is an environmental and health advocacy organization that has produced the annual report for the last 20 years. So again, let's do this, um, break it down. The 12 foods, okay? Strawberries, spinach, kale, collard greens, mustard greens. I'm going to run out of fingers. Grapes, peaches, pears, nectarines, apples, bell peppers. Oh, I guess they're considering some of these, like the collard greens and the mushroom greens is one. Bell peppers and hot peppers is one. So cherries and blueberries and green beans. That's way more than 12. I can do math and that's definitely more than 12. But those things are all considered the most um, pesticide holding or pesticide used uh, fruits and vegetables that you're going to find on your grocery store shelves. Now, pesticides have been linked in studies to preterm births, congenital malformations such as neural tube defects, spontaneous abortions, and an increase in genetic damage in humans. Exposures to pesticides has also been associated with lower sperm concentrations, heart disease, cancer, and other disorders. We already know our food is killing us. There's, that's nothing new. Um, the uptick in cancers and, uh, you know, mental defects and physical abnormalities has skyrocketed since we as a country decided that, um, what is the word, processed foods and mass um, distribution and mass growing, uh, those things have changed the way our food is grown, the way our food is harvested, the way our food is distributed, and in, in turn, it has affected our bodies and the things that our bodies can fight off and cannot fight off, the illnesses, the diseases, the everything else. Yes, there were things back, you know, in the 19, early 1900s, late 1800s, uh, whatever, that were horrific, you know, bubonic plague and all these other fun things. Actually, I don't know what year that was, so don't quote me on knowing that. But those things all sucked, but they weren't because of the pesticides used in food. They weren't because of the chemicals used in food. They weren't because of all these things we can no longer pronounce or understand what they are in our foods. The more we, and I, when I say we, I don't mean you and I, I mean like they, but we're talking about whatever. So the more we or they decide to alter food, mess with food, try to make it so that they don't need real, real meat, real vegetables, real anything, and they try to turn it into all this other crap, the sicker we're all going to be as a society. You know it, I know it, they know it, they don't give two shits because us being sick is how they keep making money because that's what doctors are for. Not to heal you, not to prevent it, just to band-aid it for the rest of your life so that you're stuck spending all bukus of money on doctor's visits and medicines and everything else. Anyway, that sounds high horsey, not high horsey, but it sounds like I'm bitching, which I am, but it's fine. Now, 
Farm workers who use or are exposed to pesticides are at highest risk. According to studies, a 2022 meta-analysis found workers exposed to pesticides were nearly five times as likely to have DNA damage. Y'all, DNA damage. Do you understand that? DNA damage. Like, these people are trying to earn a living, and here they are, DNA damage. Now, let's get real... Um, Oh, I don't even know the right word to use here, but let's get real. I guess it's dark. I don't know. Right now we have the massive influx of illegal immigrants and a lot of them are being allowed in and brought in, flown in, if you will, by President Biden to uh, remember we talked about being farm workers. So does that mean our government is willingly letting these men and women come in so they are the ones who have the damaged DNA instead of American citizens? Like, if you look at it that way, is it okay then? Is it okay that we have an influx of illegal immigrants and ones being flown in and given work visas so they can work farm-related jobs? Because that's what they're saying, that it's for farm labor because a lot of uh, other people either don't want to do it or it's too expensive for Americans to do it. I'm not quite sure their reasoning, but what if the reasoning is, like, literally, what if they're like, no, we're doing this to save you because we know farm workers are five times more likely to have DNA damage and would rather damage non-citizens. I mean, I don't think our government loves us like that, but it, it is something to kind of sort of think about in the long scheme, long scheme, big scheme, long run of things. Anyway, so we're going to keep moving on. Um, it says that children exposed at an early age showed poor neurodevelopment from infancy to adolescence. Think of the areas where people live that are very close to agricultural farming, animal farming, any of these other things where you see all the chemicals being sprayed all the time. Those big machines that spray chemicals all day long. There is, I mean, there is literal proof that people living in those areas have a much higher chance of obesity, much higher chance of uh, cancers and diabetes and all kinds of different issues. And it, it comes back to a lot of times because of what is being sprayed. It gets into the water. It gets into the soil. It is everywhere. And it really does wreak havoc on not just the people, but think about what it does then to the food, to the animals, to the, the fruits and vegetables, to absolutely everything because of all these pesticides and everything that are being used to grow the food that we then eat and put in our bodies and then wonder why our bodies are crapping out at such early ages. So, um... But it's not all bad news. Yay. Uh, avocados, sweet corn, pineapples, onions, and papayas led the Clean 15. Oh, hey. Uh, list of conveniently grown produce with the least amount of trace pesticides. Nearly 65% of fruits and veggies in that grouping had no detectable pesticide residues, according to the report released on Wednesday. Now, rounding out the Clean 15, in case you guys were curious, were frozen sweet peas. Not regular, but frozen. Asparagus, honeydew melons. Ugh. Oh, I hate honeydew. Uh, kiwis, cabbage, watermelons, mushrooms, mangoes, sweet potatoes, and carrots. Side note, have you guys ever seen the video on YouTube where somewhere in some Asian country they made cabbage from... I don't, I don't, they pulled it out their ass or something. I don't know how they made it, but there's a video out there of them making cabbage. It's not real. They put this, this like solution in water and kept spinning it or something like that. And it just kept making new little leaves for cabbage. And then it looked like a whole head of cabbage, but it wasn't real cabbage. And I'm pretty sure that's what's in the stir fry anytime you go somewhere. It was very disturbing. I don't have a link to it at all, but if you just Google it or um, YouTube, look it up, just look up, I guess, fake cabbage, you'll see what I'm talking about. And then you may never eat cabbage again because then how do you know what's real and what's not? That's always been my question. How do you know what's real and what's not? Which is why I buy stuff with the organic label because it has to be real. It can't be fake. So anyway, we'll continue on. Now, according to this, each year, a rotating list of domestic and imported produce, don't forget we import a lot of crap from a lot of countries, is tested by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Staffers at the USDA Pesticide Data Program will wash, peel, and scrub fruits and vegetables as consumers would, while workers at the FDA only brush dirt off the produce. Then the fruits and vegetables are tested for more than 250 different pesticides, and the results are posted online. There's a little thing where I can click here, which means it'll give me the results. I will put a link to this article and that result thingy in the pinned comment of this video in case you guys want it. Now, for 2024, EWG researchers examined uh, testing data on 47,510 
samples of 46 non-organic fruits and vegetables with the majority of testing from the USDA. An analysis of that data found traces of 254 pesticides in all fruits and vegetables analyzed with 209 of those chemicals on produce in the dirty dozen list. Look, it's getting dark in here because it is almost 6 p.m. The sun is going down, just so you know. So if you can't see me, it is what it is. You'll be fine. Just listen. Um, we find that what ends up on one list versus the other reflects how those fruits and vegetables are grown. That feels like a duh kind of comment, but whatever. This is according to Alexis Temkin, who is EWG's senior toxicologist. Avocados, for example, aren't pesticide uh, intensive, while strawberries grow very close to the ground and have lots of pests like pesticides, pests or pesticides. Anyway, uh, about 70% of non-organic produce tested by the USDA and FDA have pesticide levels within the legal limits allowed by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. We know how much the EPA actually gives a shit about people. Uh, the fact makes the uh, report misleading, said Carl Winter, emeritus professor of cooperative extension at the University of California, Davis. That would be the longest thing on a business card. That's a really long title. Anyway, the dose makes the poison, not its presence or its absence, and that dose determines the potential for harm. In many cases, you'd have to be exposed to a million times more than what we're exposed to before you'd see any effects. I hear ya, bro, but I don't really believe you given the uptick of people with cancers and whatnot. Um, he says, however, legal levels do not mean safe levels. Timken said in a response, she pointed to times when regulators allowed potentially dangerous chemicals such as the pesticide DCPA, to remain on the market long after scientific research had raised concerns. Because again, it's all about the money, profit over people, not your health. The herbicide, the herbicide was linked to thyroid cancers for years or thyroid concerns for years before the EPA told the public the chemical posed significant risk to human health in 2023. Literally just a couple months ago, the EPA was like, listen, we should probably let you know this stuff isn't great for you. We've known it forever. We're not going to take it off of anything. We're just going to give you a heads up. We'll hide it in an article somewhere on a newspaper online that you might not see. That way we can say we told you, but most of y'all probably didn't know. I didn't know. Just so you know. Uh, another example, chloroperifos, sure, a pesticide linked to brain damage in children and fetuses. The American Academy of Pediatrics joined EWG in 2017 protesting the ETA's continued approval of the chemical. In addition, pesticides banned by the government continue to show up on crops sold in the U.S., looky cookie. There's a whole, whole lot more in this article, but you guys would not want me to be here for another 20 minutes. I will just say you need to read this whole entire thing. I'm going to put a link to it in the pinned comment. But what I want to take away from this is I want people to remember you can't be scared to eat. You can't go, well, I'm just not going to eat because there's so much shit and everything. Yeah, it is what it is. You have to understand that and you have to be okay with that. And you have to do what you have to do to try to negate some of the negativity drink as much clean water as you can which again is a oxymoron in itself how much of our water is actually clean work out try to you know eat as many organic things as you can if you can't it is what it is obviously do not go broke trying to buy clean foods um but when you have the options go for it obviously if you can like i said uh just make sure that you're not purposefully eating chemical filled things the the more you can stay away from processed things the better even though obviously this article is about fruits and vegetables being laced with pesticides um, just keep in mind that there's a lot more crap in everything that's processed in my personal opinion. So just, just honestly, you, you got to do what you got to do for yourselves, but it's good to be informed and understand what's going on with our food supply, with, uh, what they're allowed to use in the foods. And then you make your choices from there. So I personally, like I said, fruits and vegetables, I try to buy organic as much as humanly possible just because of the pesticide situation and things like that. I don't do organic everything under the sun. Obviously, it's not feasible. Uh, it's very expensive. But for fruits and vegetables, I try my hardest and I make concessions in a lot of other places, right? I, ha I have not been to Starbucks in like five months, just so y'all know. One, because, you know, a lot of people dislike them, but I've also found a mom and pop place closer to me that I much, much prefer and it's supporting a local business as opposed to a conglomerate or whatever else. But also it saves me money so that I can then use what I'm saving there towards what is healthier for me, which are the organic fruits and vegetables and whatnots like that. So that's that.
just random conversation I wanted to have. Tomorrow, listen, tomorrow, I want to talk to you about uh, some East Palestine stuff, East Palestine, Ohio, and, and stuff like that, but also some murders, if you will, and um, some Norfolk Southern cover-ups and some Bill and Hillary Clinton stuff. It's going to be an interesting video, so I hopefully you guys come back for that. I love you, Squirrel Tribe. Thank you for having this moment with me, letting me have this conversation with you. Um, thoughts and opinions and everything in the comments as normal so we can have this community chat, if you will. And, oh, somebody said one time in a comment, like, I hate it when you say, if you will. Well, if you will, kiss my ass. I, I like to say it. It's my phrase. It is what it is. So that's all, Squirrel Tribe. I love y'all, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye.